starting the broadcast now. Let's run Periscope, get that going. Welcome, Scopers. To use your camera <laughs> to fix my hair. <laughs> you know. Welcome. All right, we're going to give you a behind the scenes uh, look at our set here. Uh, you can ask questions. We're probably going to be looking more at the. Uh, I guess that's, that's probably not a great way to do that, is it? There you go. That is EP. Whoa, you get to see EP. 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 Way to nice. EP. I have more than a backside. Nice ah, to see you. Thanks. <laughs> thanks Back to the backside. Nice. Okay. I'll flip the camera around. Um, so we're going to be behind the scenes here with STEM jobs. Uh, this is our, I would call it call it daily job doctor. This is STEM, STEM chef, chef. Right. So cooking was up. Really pointing at me, but that's okay. They, what, they, what they get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> there it's kind of like it's kind of like that. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna actually flip this around. So I'm probably gonna really annoy you with the camera shot that we got here. Uh, you get to see behind the scenes of the presentation we're about to give. This goes on for is it 30 minutes? Or so, yeah. Or so, 30 minutes or so. Um, oh. We'll chat with you all. If you have all questions, this is all about STEM literacy, which is um, what we're working on. Right here, we're reaching high schools. We know any high school, and there's a link that we put on to the um, uh, link that we put on there. Great thing to say from Philly. Um, there's a link on there if you actually want to go to the Hangouts and view us uh, via Hangouts. You can do that. Um, we're going to be talking into the camera out here. I will try to keep. Um, I am. How old am I? How old am I? How old are you? I'm 42. You're 43. <laughs> He's not allowed to tell how old I am. So <laughs> I just did. Very nice. I just did. You just told how old I am. So sorry, <laughs> I'm older than I look. We've got a few people no, in the room so I far. I older than I am. I'm not sure. One of those two things. So we're gonna see. Um, uh, we're at. Oh, where, we, where are we? We are currently in Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania, and yep. we are in the studio set here behind the scenes at STEM Jobs Labs. STEM Jobs Labs. We're going to be getting um, going pretty soon. We're going to be going really soon uh, for our other audience. So take a look. Uh, again, there's a link if you want to come straight to the um, live link. What is this thing? For those of you on uh, the webinar, if you wanted to uh, use a chat, let us know where you're from. Tilt that um, on there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, so we've got Jordan out there. Uh, Jordan, if you want to let us know where you're you're from, that'd be great. Uh, Pat's going to throw up a poll pretty soon, um, asking if you are an educator, K-12, college level, college admin, uh, employer, nonprofit. You know where where you're from. If you get into that poll, that'd be great. Uh, again, Jordan, welcome to the uh, webinar. We're we'll going a little bit. We're sort of hanging out here while we wait for everyone to join us. Uh, that poll is up. Thank you to EP for getting that up. Appreciate that. It was better. Sorry, you're talking to everybody. Doesn't audience show me the, all the time. It's gonna be you all ah, the time, and man. my hand gestures. So it's really about the hand <laughs> gestures. <laughs> this, this is live, so Lots let's this. careful with the hand gestures. Want to make sure. Oh. Sorry, you can see you can see most of us, right? You can see him. Yeah, there. The better to see me though. Okay, so we'll try to talk. We're actually talking in that direction, so um, and you've got a screen behind us, which is kind of hard to see. And we're going to get rolling here with our live audience uh, once I get the presentation up. It's on here. You guys won't be able to see this, but if you come to the, if you click on the Hangout piece, you can come into the actual Hangout, see the uh, all the content that we were about to share and go through today around STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Right. Make it interesting for your kids. Get we've, got, uh, we've got Jordan, uh, Jordan uh, Hale. He works at the University of Arkansas, Paul awesome. Smith okay. Missions Office. So. Fantastic. Oh, you're going to like uh, yeah, what we're sharing today because we actually have some of the feedback from the STEM Jobs Approved Survey last year, uh, looking at what employers are doing as well as what colleges are doing. Um, those are performing well and doing well in these particular areas. So we've got some good statistics that will be near the end, so you're going to have to hang with us to get to the good stats uh, out of our survey, but thanks for joining us. And we got some, we got two things going on. We got the uh, folk here on Periscope. Periscope again. There we go. 
So now you can't hardly see it, Glenn, if I do that. <laughs> I can hide, too. Yeah. So. It's all Glenn's fault here. So yeah, Glenn, uh, Glenn Zolman, Daniel Nichols. Daniel Nichols. That's me. Or, alternatively, uh, the job doctor and STEM chef. STEM chef, because you can tell that he's actually wearing a chef outfit. Put my chef suit on. We're going to be cooking nice. up some trouble today. See, that's actually a good shot right there. I just, just like hold that the entire time. <laughs> the entire time, nice. And do it that way. Yeah. You can see it here. Oh, put it up there on your screen. Put it up here. Ooh, that's super cool. Yeah, then I can't. Then I can't oh, see no, you. We're, oh, now we're live. See, so now I'm messing with stuff while you guys are live. So, sorry, we're setting up. Uh, We've got high tech. Got uh, high tech stuff here. I'm trying to give the other audience who's on periscopes. If you all have periscope, see, now you can't see anybody at all. Yeah. Those of you that are in the production we business, we're using a, a high-tech device called a <laughs> roll of tape. <laughs> to, you can see that. To prop up the phone. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you can see it right there, the roll of tape. Ah, there we go. Nice. Right, now, you, now you can only see the screen, though. Like, you yeah, can see, still see the, see the screen. The hand and arm us. movements, though. And arm gestures. Pointing out things that are on the screen. Move in slightly more. Why are you showing your Oh, am I doing it? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, fantastic. we got the stuff just running here. I think it's because I like hooked on my uh, like seamless. No. Yeah. All right, sorry people, we're getting there. I think it, it like plugged in and then plugged out. My phone did. So. It's a busy STEM day, man. I got a lot it's going a busy on. Busy STEM day. There we go. That's better. All kinds of stuff happening in the STEM world. So I'll point that. <laughs> you see that uh, they found water on Mars. I saw that. Well, now wait. Did they find water or the evidence of water having been there? They, they actually have. I saw. I saw pictures that actually show uh, evidence over, over time. Evidence of water. Water. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why it's very, very salty. Otherwise, it would evaporate. Yes. Uh, so your dreams of living on Mars. That just much closer one, to reality. One step closer to right. reality. Yeah. I went on to Expedia and tried to book a flight. Yeah. Uh, Not still, there yet. You still can't. Well, you know, we we uh, we talked with is it SpaceX? Yeah. I know we uh, Lockheed Martin's actually featured in the upcoming issue on aerospace. Um, Aerospace sciences, and, right. and we're going to have the top ten jobs in those fields, which is pretty cool. Um, that's coming up pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. pretty, I think, about five times in that one sentence. Yeah, pretty. That's pretty good. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well. So, yeah, but SpaceX is uh, kind of uh, one of the, one of the folks that we're looking at talking to soon. Yep. Um, seeing if they can. I, I'm hoping that they can strap you in one of those rockets that they shoot up and they come back down, and land the platform. Yes. I think it'd be just to get a go up and then come back down. Give you a GoPro camera tied to that like rocket. You're to the outside of the rocket. Right. You know, for STEM There's jobs no class. Because the next next iteration that we do of this is actually be more of an exploratory piece. Uh, right. See, now I'm talking to the camera up there. Good, good um, skills. Explain. <laughs> I'm going to talk to all of you, not just to this dude, because we should be talking to you, your audience. Uh, exploratory piece. We're, we'll be looking at um, you know curriculum. We'll, hopefully, we're doing some campus visits. So. I don't know if Jordan. Um, anyway, it'd be, it'd be really cool to get to get some of you in the audience uh, on these hangouts in the future. Uh, we'll be talking to some of the STEM jobs approved uh, organizations. If you haven't done that, we'll have a link up here later on for you to um, for you to check those things out. So we're going to roll into our content. We got a ton of stuff to cover today. This is the yeah. third in a series of three. It was kind of anticlimactic saying it that way. The third in a series of three. Why was it FO come out? Well, I don't know. It just seemed like third and final. The third and final. The right now on this particular one. Yeah. Yeah. EP uh, is back there telling us to move along. Yeah. Real Here. quick before we get going, we got Band Terry in the room range. too. Terry, uh, if you wanted to, we got we have a poll going. So if you want to let us know kind of what your role is, and if you want to use the chat, you can also just tell us where you're from and what you do. We'd love to uh, to know kind of you know where what your background is. Um, I mean, we're with us on uh, Periscope, too, if you want to shout out, let us know if you have anything to do with education at all. Uh, right there, so. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get going. So last time we um, were here, we talked about the, the four ingredients, effectively, right. to, um, to improving STEM literacy overall and to building greater um, partnerships and programs that work. Uh, for, for students in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we talked about the first two of the four ingredients. Right, student opportunity and career focus. Yes. So you know, answering those, those 
first two two questions. Um, uh, can I do what I love? Uh, that's one of our big themes here is can I do what I love and, and when am I ever going to use this? Uh, two, two big topics around you know my background as an educator, uh, you know, trying to get students engaged, trying to get them to be passionate about STEM subjects. And uh, so we talked a lot about those last week. And this week we're tackling the, the next two yes. in that list. Which will be diversity. Right. And uh, and partnership, and so the, the four fundamental questions. You had two of those, right? right. And again, if, in terms of um, curating almost immediate, uh, in, in an immediate difference, like today in your program. So that's your college, because we have some employers that have been with us too, or your high school, and you're you're with us now. Um, but to have immediate impact, ask these questions of your current programs: outreach, recruitments. Um, Classrooms, etc. Ask these four questions of that, and, and as you, the, the greater you're able to address these particular questions, the greater outcomes you will have um, in terms of student engagement, academic um, uh, excellence, and academic outcomes, and then ultimately uh, building more college-ready, uh, college-bound, and career-oriented uh, students. Yeah. So the second of these is uh, how can I do what I love uh, in terms of career. So those things that I love, that going back to the American dream concept, how can I get there? So today it's about diversity, uh, which is answering the question, is there a place for me? Right. Can, can students see themselves in those roles? Can they, can they visualize themselves as you know, taking on the, those jobs or what, what things are going on in the environment that might be limiting them in those, those ways? You know, and if we discussed a few times, you know, diversity is, is not just uh, enabling uh, underrepresented populations to enter STEM jobs, but also making sure that there's a diverse range of uh, STEM opportunities available to those, those folks. Absolutely. So we'll be digging into that today. And then the other piece we're going to dig into uh, is a partnership concept, which is how can I answer the question, how can I get there? So if we lead all the students, if we lead individuals, wherever they are, down this path of, you know what, uh, this is why you should focus on this content, because here's how it connects to the real world. Uh, yes, you can do what you love. Here's some areas that will help you discover what those things are. Yes, there is a place for you. Look, there's others that are like you that have been there before, that have paved the pathway for you. you got to answer this last question. How can I get there? Then? Right. So many students, uh, when, I, when I taught high school, like, they came to my class already believing that there wasn't an opportunity for them, that there was no path to making that happen. And uh, so early on, we've got to show them that, that there actually is a way for them to get there, that uh, they can they can pay for college, they can pay for the training, uh, or they can enter into programs where that might be paid for them. And, and that's where a lot of that partnership element comes in, is that we need the corporate uh, sector, we need the, the college sector to really step up and show students that they can, in fact, uh, reach those dreams and goals. Yes. Uh, welcome to Terry, too. We see that um, you mentioned that you work in workforce development on a national level, which is fantastic. Uh, you may have some great input into this because you are most likely right in the midst of bringing all of these entities together. Um, so we're, we're also, also definitely looking for additional partners um, as we move forward here. So let's let's move on. So diversity partnership, we're going to hit it in kind of those orders and, and the concept of what this like does. That I look really good in that picture. You do. I just, I, I look, so here, yeah. this looks kind of That's like my you. old job as the uh, executive chef at the Stonewall. Yes. Resort and we kind of noticed that uh, you're cooking bananas foster here. You yes. should probably not pull that, you know, out too well. I, I like I like cooking with fire. It's it, that's good stuff. Yes. So well, we're cooking. It's really really a lot of, a lot of uh, skill to make cooking with four ingredients today. Right. We got the four key. Yeah, you brought some ingredients over here. It's like <laughs> I've got some ingredients for the for our secret sauce here. Yeah. What we're going to it look like secret sauce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. All right. So uh, these two pieces are really about transforming organizational culture, whether you're a, a college or uh, an employer or a partner, and transforming the classroom culture. Right, it's right. A bit too big. The last ones that we covered last week were really about student engagement, engaging them in these subjects. Today's about cultural uh, transformation. Yeah, I mean, it's you. You have to have an environment set up where. Uh, where that that's just the norm that those things are, are happening every day that it's that there aren't uh, barriers put in the way uh, so if students do get engaged and students are excited about things that there aren't obstacles that are happening along the way and that's what today's really about yeah. absolutely 
good. So first question, uh, if we ask students what they want to be, we need to show them what they could be. And so the question of diversity is we want to address here today. Um, interesting quote that we've got, uh, we pulled out. At the heart of the challenge uh, in diversity is to some extent or to a great extent reconstituting our understanding of what ability and intelligence really mean. Right. One of the big things with that is just that idea that uh, um, you can learn new things. There's that whole growth mindset piece we, we did with uh, we did a lot of looking into the research of Carol Dweck and, and growth mindset. Um, you know, lots of studies done uh, around the fact that you actually can learn new things that you're not fixed in terms of your intelligence and mindset so that when students find things that they really are interested in and really love to do, that uh, if we enable their um, that, that pathway, then we can totally get them in, going in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, part of that, part and parcel of that, is this concept that human communities uh, depend on a diversity of talent and not a singular conception of what ability is. Right. Uh, so when we talk about diversity, there's the, the obvious components uh, in terms of science, technology, engineering, math careers, uh, just simply lacking females and minorities in those types of career positions and in the pipelines in those career positions. So that's fundamental, but important to getting to solving that point is understanding the, the diversity of opportunity and how right. STEM literacy and STEM uh, skill sets connect across the board. And, and you know, so a big piece of that, I, I think I go back to 2013 um, and uh, the publication of the, the Brookings Institution study, and uh, we may have a link that we'll be able to put up for you all to, to, uh, to connect with that. The, but that was a foundational piece, and what the Brookings Institution really did was um, kind of the hidden STEM, STEM economy and took on this challenge that for years and years, STEM is not new, right. um, but really was being seen as the standard sort of traditional research-based science and math uh, subjects. Right. And really STEM it goes well beyond that into healthcare and computer science and vocational and technical uh, types of positions. And, and fundamentally, what we showed in the very first um, of these issues, those STEM literacy skills are required and more and more so in pretty much all occupations overall. So right. I think it was it the uh, Georgetown study that went into the idea about STEM competencies. Yes. And again, that broader definition of, of STEM as being uh, foundational to so many occupations. I think last week we talked about the fact that a lot of uh, a lot of people that are in STEM uh, degree programs get hired into sort of non-STEM uh, careers because those the, the skills that they learn there are so usable and so valuable to those non non-STEM uh, job, which makes you really question the idea of them being non-STEM jobs, because you know if those skills are really really important, then obviously that's a fundamental piece, and we that, I think that's the whole idea about sort of shifting our paradigm about what it means to be a STEM job and what STEM careers really are. Yeah, uh, just that exposure piece to a, a, an environment where where you're facing down challenges around science and math, you're utilizing those skills. What I experienced uh, in healthcare, and to some of you that don't know the you know the background, um, did have worked in the U.S. Department of Labor for a number of years, but then also directed uh, recruitment to large across a large health system. And what we found uh, was that a lot of our, our sort of the non-technical, non-STEM positions overall, people were just being taken out um, by other employers around us because of the exposure that they had. And what they found in that Georgetown study is. It's just uh, that, that literacy piece, the STEM literacy piece, leads to uh, the types of, um, of outcomes, critical thinking, and complex problem solving, et cetera, that every employer, pretty much every job is looking for. Right. Yeah, as, a, as an educator, you know, I, you're, you're tasked with engineering solutions to student achievement. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to evaluate data, analyze the information. You've got to make a hypothesis about you know, what is going to be a good solution for, the, for this student, for all of your students engineer your, your programming. There's there's so much STEM that goes into education in general, regardless of if you're teaching English or you're teaching science. I mean, those, those educators have to use those problem solving skills, that anal those analysis skills, and they've got to really construct these uh, very dynamic models uh, of education in order to meet the needs of, of students. And the teachers that I always saw that did that best were the ones that really had those STEM skills and, and and we're able to apply those um, in, in a variety of ways. So let's address um, 
just the, the, the fundamental challenge now in terms of pipeline. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and there are some studies that I think we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, looking at these these pipelines around females, around minorities in these particular STEM subjects that you're referencing. Um, this, this one in particular coming out of Forbes in 2012 just looked at uh, cohorts and following. And we know that in recent, uh, very recent years, like so Twitter and Facebook and many of the Silicon Valley uh, tech clients out there had not prior actually published what their diversity uh, data statistics were and then have started to do so, understanding that, that the numbers were terrible. I mean, yeah, they really were, were not good. Uh, and a, a large issue around that is it's just fundamentally, and for those of you who can't see this, uh, we'll certainly be sharing it with you, but if you look at just the number of boys and their interest levels in IT fields uh, versus girls and their interest levels at very early age from childhood to high school to work and then executives, uh, you see it just starts with a, a much smaller pool. Yeah, only 35% of, of girls are interested in those fields at a young age. And uh, what I was talking about earlier was the study that just says that, uh, that that young girls especially are often dissuaded from entering those 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 um, areas uh, by by teachers at uh, in elementary school, which are also primarily females. Um, and it's almost a subliminal kind of uh, thing that happens: is that they 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 themselves are often a little bit uh, unsure, uncertain, untrained in those areas. And, and the students pick up on that, and they again, it's about sort of seeing yourself in those positions, and they see their their female role models, their teachers. That point, uh, person they spend, you know, a lot of time with, uh, being uncertain and unsure about about math and science and those kind of things, and so they themselves pick up this inherent idea that oh, I guess it's more of a boy thing, uh, and so we have to create a culture, like to changing that classroom culture around the idea that. No, it's it's something that that's great for for everybody, boys and girls, uh, regardless of if you're you know ethnicity, all of those things. It's it's really um, a proactive stance in that way, uh, promoting those kind of things versus just sort of being passive about it. Yeah, and this this reality hit home for me. Uh, Jordan, you may have some input on on this kind of thing, but um, and what you all are doing at University of Arkansas um, uh, to avoid what I experienced recently. My daughter just started college. Uh, we are visiting uh, a number of colleges back in the springtime, so that's you know, a fairly normal sort of thing. And she loves physics, loves physics. Um, wound up not choosing physics, and the main reason why, she went into a campus, and um, that experience there, she came into the physics department like that, and it was just a, an incredibly negative uh, experience that she had. One, it was all boys everywhere, um, so she didn't, couldn't see herself there in that particular classroom, that all the faculty were, were male. And, and honestly, their posture in that group, because I'm there with them, right? The posture in that group was very different toward her than it was toward the boys in that, in that cohort. And it was all, it's just challenging, this is hard, you know. It was amazing, and she wound up, she was great, and she does very well, she just wound up choosing biology, so I'm glad we were able to, you know, retain her in a STEM field and get on that track. But I was excited for a while about, hey, the daughter who loves it, right. loves physics, loves it. It does very well in it, and decided not to pursue it. Now, all too often, I think that's um, it's a kind of thing that we end up seeing. And, right. uh, we need to get well beyond that. And I guess to that point, so those of you that are employers that are interviewing, those of you that are parents uh, out there, those of you who are with universities, I mean, if, so even if that student doesn't go uh, to your university, those critical touch points that they have with you uh, during those moments, it's, it's, a, it's a community activity, it's a... Uh, it's a Career day, it's you know whatever it is that they're impact with you. Your um, your input, you you have the, the ability to make or break um, whether these individuals, uh, women, minorities, especially, end up choosing these types of career paths by how positive or negative you, you are. Yeah, and I think also providing them with um, providing them with experiences that that really do fit their interests too. You know, it's. We, we, we talked a lot, I know, the last few uh, of, our, of our hangouts about the, the Cirque du Soleil interview we did, you know, around um, people think about mechanical engineering, they think about uh, that as being a very kind of, uh, as a very solid perception of what it means to be a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't often think about that in terms of arts or sports or things like that. But, you know, uh, Cirque du Soleil employs a whole bunch of engineers from all different facets to do their automation, to do their 
their safety systems uh, to, to manage these, these shows. And that's just one example of, of how you change that perception so that you don't think of, uh, of that or a physics classroom as being this very stereotypical, you know, uh, male-dominated, white male-dominated profession, but it really is, there's a, there's a huge breadth of opportunities within that, that that they can enter into. And the more that, that employers and colleges uh, facilitate exposure to that, you know, they're going to really improve the diversity in their programs. For sure. And that's some of the content pieces that we end up featuring in our toolkit right. that goes into high schools. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about that today. It's going behind the scenes. We've got uh, toy design coming up. We've done food and fashion and how STEM integrates with these particular uh, industries that are out there. One of the uh, research-based um, uh, findings overall is that modeling positive attitudes towards STEM learning and encouraging parents to do the same is, is critical to addressing these particular challenges. I want to point to um, some of the studies that came out of the Girl Scouts of America. I don't know if, if, if some of you have not um, looked at the study that they published back in 2012. Um, about, you know, from their girls, uh, really insightful, I think, and this is one of the top ones. So these are girls aged uh, 14 to 17 that, that took this survey, and um, what a career they love, right? All right, 93 percent want a career they love, which is, which is great, and that's... That's kind of like the dentist, right? Yeah, there's always that, that fifth dentist that Nine says, out of ten suggest you brush. should brush your teeth, so I'm like, right. what, what seven percent of it's girls... It's always four out of five, too. <laughs> they don't ever ask ten dentists, they yeah. always ask five. So I don't, I don't know what you got. Poor girls, right? Apparently there's 7% of the girls out there that just want a career they hate. They want a horrible career. So right. those of you that have jobs that are terrible, there's 7% of that will fill right. those jobs and be happy with it. So. And then there's 74% that are interested in STEM STEM careers. Yes. So they, they have some interest in, in, in that, which is a really high number. Very high. really impressive. An understanding of it, right? So right. this do what you love concept is where we start. What would you love to do? And we're finding in this cohort, which is a lot of girls that took this. 74% are saying I, the, what I would want to do is has science, technology, and right. math. But then only 13% have STEM career as their first choice. Yeah. So, and again, that probably boils down to more that, that perception, that not really understanding what a STEM career is, and that the fact that it's been so tightly, uh, you know, narrowly defined over the years. Yeah. And, I, and a lot of that, too, uh, comes to this next piece. So you dig into the data a little bit deeper and what is going on here, why this, this huge fall off. And a lot of that comes to the home, to the people that are around them, to the attitudes um, about these types of careers, even the local communities that they have. And so uh, you look there, and you're looking at uh, you know, knowing someone. So the same girls, and we're looking here now at diversity as well. But I know someone in a STEM career. Uh, and so African Americans are like 48% of the girls uh, there even knew anyone in a STEM career. Um, one or both of my parents are in a STEM career, 29%, 18%. Um, 23 percent. So, you know, if those that are in your house, right, and, and in your local community, and your teachers and others, this, the college you're visiting, and they're not doing these things, and how can you see yourself in them? It's a huge challenge. Yeah, and and, and the, the, the parent piece there is, is, is huge in terms of parents being able to accurately inform students about what STEM careers are, about the usefulness of STEM. Uh, you know, I, I would always have students that would, that would come in and with comments like, well, you know, my, my dad said he never uses math at all in his job. Uh, you know, thing, things like that. Or, or my mom said, well, I was never very good at math either. Mm -hmm. You know, those are things that often parents say as a way to try to, like, uh, you know, placate their, their child, make their child feel better about those fields, but they actually are very limiting. They're very, uh, they, they set caps on what students think they can achieve, when, when in fact the best thing they can do is, is encourage students to say, you know what, those, those classes can be difficult. And part of that part of the, the benefit of going through that challenge is overcoming those struggles, uh, because that teaches you to be perseverant, teaches you to be more successful. Success does not come by doing things that are easy. You know, if we only limit ourselves to things that were easy, we none of us would be here. Yeah. You know, we'd, we'd still be pushing around, you know, carts like like Fred Flintstone or something with our feet. Really, the, the feet. Maybe. That's good. Know. Yeah. yeah. To that point, really, we, we added this other um, piece that comes out of the Penn Show and the Berlin Research Study out of 2012, same time frame. It said 74% of teens that considered and then eventually went in on into engineering programs and colleges did so only after being explained the impact they could have in the world. And yeah. That summarizes this generation. And so if we look at, you know, how are you as a college presenting 
presenting the, the, the content that you have. This goes back to we were talking about Eastern Kentucky uh, University and the program that we ran with them. That, that realizing this, right, that it, the the old approach, the traditional approach to these subjects in engineering, is being completely lost on this generation, especially on, on women and minorities. Unless you're doing, you're addressing the impact it can have on the world. Um, and you see, you know, there's the diversity piece is much different in in life sciences and then in healthcare, I mean, very different things. So you're, a lot of skill required there. So why is engineering not experiencing it? And you're looking at um, that's, that's a real, you know, research that's suggesting right. that our approach and our language needs to be different. And the, the before and after on that number, I think, was pretty dramatic too, wasn't it? In terms of the students that said they wanted to do STEM prior to being told that. Yeah. It's like 25 percent, and then it less. jumped up to 74 when they went, oh, I can actually make an impact. Like, like that's a dramatic, dramatic shift there. And uh, you know, yeah, when you see that connection, when you see that, oh, I can actually can do something that's going to be impactful, that's going to connect to me, then, then they're all about that. But making that connection is so hard for teachers. I mean, mm -hmm. they just don't, they don't know. When you ask students, what do you want to do, you know, students don't, they don't know what's out there. So, so you have this whole system where nobody knows what's out there. Yes. And, and, and they're asked to then, you know, connect to it and, and help students figure out this question. Yes. Which is where this next piece really becomes. It's a great transition. You just critical. brought us straight into that's, it. That's, that's called an appetizer. That's, <laughs> you know, or, or, that is a chef yeah. at work. Yeah, it's yeah. like the sorbet of my, of my life right there. Cleanse the palate on the next one. All right. So how can I get there, which is all about partnership, which is all about why we've invited a, a diverse different group of organizations from employers to colleges to high schools to workforce development organizations and other partners to, to come and to join us in the effort here because that that is the key challenge, right? There right. It is a broken, if it works somewhere, you know, some places around the country are going to look at uh, some of the places that it's working, uh, but a key challenge that we've got is, uh, is is to make this real for students. You've got to create these opportunities for students and that starts with partnerships. Right, yeah. And I know that we've got a colleague of ours down in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, has a great example of Apprenticeships going on down there, where where the, the business community and colleges and, and high schools are really working solidly together. And uh, she shared a, a video, and maybe we can get uh, EP to, to share that uh, after. I don't have it right now, but I just just sort of thought of it. You just thought of it. We could have <laughs> on a, on scheduled that. I know. That up I'm and sorry. Showing everyone here. I'm sorry. Uh, apologize. It's really EP's fault. Yeah, it happen. really is. Um, maybe you could track that but down. The, the interesting thing about that is, is as I remember watching it, the, the diversity displayed amongst that group of people that were part of that, that internship program was was phenomenal. You know, it really speaks to when you when you get all the parts in motion, it really does work. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things we want to look at today, and I, I apologize that you are not able to see this as well as um, good. You're going to move our... Well, it's blocking the stats. Blocking the stats. Okay. Yeah. Whatever yours are. Um, yeah, so, right, so, the, so we know, hopefully, you're aware of the STEM Jobs Approved Survey uh, process that open that will continue to be open. We'll have uh, industry awards here, fairly national awards that will be uh, listed out. If you are a high school or school district, if you are a partner, nonprofit, workforce development, governmental agency, otherwise, if you are a college, if you're an employer, uh, we, you know, we've been collecting uh, data around you and from you and your colleagues. We're going to look at what some of that data looks like last year from last year's cohort that took it. Um, in this case, we'll start with colleges. What are they doing? What are the colleges doing that are having the greatest um, uh, impact on improving um, you know, female minority diversity uh, interest, student interest overall, engagement around STEM subjects, and have the you know the right graduation rates and employment rates that follow from there. So. Yeah, and our survey focuses on those four key. Components uh, of opportunity, career focus, diversity, and uh, partnership. Yes. So that's you know all the information that we got from from those surveys from last year and the ones that we're talking this year are all based around what are you doing in those four key areas. And yes. And the questions that we're asking really uh, come down to the measures, the activities, right. uh, and the outcomes that are are, are most relevant uh, from a research basis uh, toward toward achieving the ultimate end goal. Yeah. One of the key things we ask is, are you in fact tracking this? Yes. Are, you, are you looking toward, you know, making sure that these things are, are evident in your programs? Yep, and that's a significant piece. Like, just if you don't measure it, how can you get better at doing it? Right. You don't so, know it even exists. So. Yeah, do you even track it? 
uh, really a step even beyond from tracking it. Do you share that with anyone else um, in the, across the organization? So you may have data and then just not even know that you're collecting this data. So one of the first pieces that we asked about, are you tracking female faculty in STEM programs? Uh, so of those that have the best outcomes overall, 96%. Uh, yeah, so the ones that are really making differences are, are doing that, which makes sense. For sure. Right. Now, the numbers, right, so when we look at diversity, because it's a big, you know, a large, significant piece of this, um, the numbers are not fantastic. Right. In fact, the, from employer, from the employer standpoint, uh, standpoint, we'll get into some of those numbers, are, are really not great at all. It's a start. There's a lot of work. 74% of the, well, the workforce in STEM is white male, so we know that we have challenges to begin with. Right. Uh, but of those top schools, and maybe so look at your school, right, uh, your college, where you're at. Uh, and this goes down to high schools. We have the Nevada high schools now to the mix, so we'll be sharing some of that data as we come out. Uh, but so to the average uh, percent of female faculty in STEM programs, 37%. The other piece that we asked was senior faculty. So our advisory council really said, you know, just having female faculty is, is one piece of this, but to have real effective long-term impact and outcomes on these programs, uh, to drive kind of cultural change, they need to be in senior positions, to, in, in the positions of authority. So we find down changing the culture. Those are the, those are the people that really have the say in changing the culture of those schools. Yes, and making those those uh, lasting impacts. So what you're seeing kind of out of these numbers is that a lot, you know, these institutions not only um, do they have, you know, one third of the faculty in their STEM programs is female, and that's not just in life sciences program, but they're also 30 um, percent. There are are in senior level positions, so they've been able to rise in those those positions. Like you said, not a great number, but when you compare it to the number we saw earlier, of, you know, the, the, the women that end up in STEM careers, that yes. was about 12 percent, I think, at the end. Yeah, in, in terms of executive positions, right. this is way higher. Yeah, so it's not great, but they're making lots of progress for sure. Uh, now, the minority picture, really low, so disappointingly low, 18 uh, percent and only 14 percent uh, in in the senior faculty positions. Uh, certainly a, a challenge. A part of that is pipeline. Right? Getting, getting enough interest, driving that interest, showing that you belong. There is a place for you here. Yeah, uh, so one of the one of the great institutions that we work fairly closely with, Tuskegee um, University, uh, is one of those that really stands out in this group and helps to kind of pull the curve up on it. Um, and so they've got some great practices, one of sharing in some of the later uh, hangouts that we're doing. So that's one area. Uh, we look to it, um, at what are you doing? Like, how do you reach out to students from a, a recruiting, advertising perspective? We want to look at you know, what these schools are, are doing. So a lot of, of utilization of kind of external firms, um, these on there. So the social networking piece, so 65% of these, um, of our STEM jobs approved are using social networking to reach students today. The number one of that is Facebook, um, to recruit, which is different than employers. So employers right. using LinkedIn, uh, but Facebook for this particular cohort, but engaging, realizing that this audience, um, and what you see overall, if you want to attract those students who have an interest in STEM, you need to use technology to do that. Right. One thing about this that I really noticed a lot was the really high percentage of, of, of colleges that are literally going on site, getting in front of these students. 68% uh, are doing high school visits, 71% are doing uh, school, college fairs, um, after school activities, so a lot of time, a lot of money being put into getting on campus, getting in front of students, that, that makes sense. You really make an impact when you are uh, when you are in front of those students and they, they, they see you face to face, they, they, they see you, but it's, it's difficult to do. It's uh, yes. a huge expense for, for colleges. Uh, it's one of the things that I think, and again, we'll talk more about kind of our, our sponsorship and how that, that works to provide colleges with better access to, um, to high school students in a much more affordable, much easier, simpler, fast way. Um, but it's yeah. obviously important to colleges to, to make that happen because what they're doing. Yes. And then the question there becomes, so how are you doing it? So we know that there's colleges want to reach out to high schools. High schools want that, but they want, you know, they need a resource. Employers want to reach out too, but they, we need resource around that. So, what does that look like? And you know, the vast majority of how high schools are sponsored, those high schools that are with us, you know, you could tell us um, what your kind of experience around that is. But uh, you know, they're sponsoring the basketball team, the baseball team, the football team, these sorts of you know, the sports. It's time to sponsor math class and science class, where we put our emphasis in front of our students, what we show them uh, in terms of importance is, is is critical. And so that's a piece uh, that we've been developing around: is how do we how do we you know, liven up, bring life to the science and math class importance there? 
uh, emphasis on those areas. And you know, some great partners that we have, like First Robotic, for, uh, are doing that sort of thing with these large events around that. How do we do that day to day? Is another question we got. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to to have a, a college or an employer come into a school and, and give a talk to students. Those are great things, but the teachers, you know, once that person leaves. Uh, you know, the excitement tends to leave with them. Uh, so having some resources to leave behind, having tangible things that teachers can use, that's that's invaluable. Uh, it really, really is. Teachers are, are always craving materials to teach from, things that get students engaged, and that's that's a, a big part of making that connection last. And that's a difficult thing for and colors don't specialize in that. So yeah, for sure. So what are the outcomes of those organizations that are that are doing well? I think that's a, a key piece, right? So those that, that are really doing the best in terms of incorporating these four areas in their college program, uh, college outreach program, we're looking at retention, right? So the retention rate, so look at your own institutions, right? Retention rate of STEM students in STEM programs. So what we looked at was not just are you retaining them in the university? So that's obviously a key piece. Are you retaining them? In because students have gotten into a STEM based for a science or a math or you know engineering major, um, have the have the, the skills to do it right. Or you wouldn't have accepted them into the programs. Um, and so we look at you know are you retaining them in other STEM programs? So maybe they are in engineering and they figure out that engineering is not really what they're passionate about. They're passionate about something else around STEM: mathematics, uh, theoretical physics. Who knows? Um, can you are you do you have programs in place to retain them? So 80% um, student retention in STEM programs, which means one you've got to track those kind of retention rates. Uh, the next piece we looked at is so retention of well, women in these STEM programs. So obviously that number is lower, but you've got percent retention. Retention of minorities in these STEM programs 61%. And again, that probably speaks to you know some of the culture shift that needs to take place. At, you know, once we get we get these you know females minorities. Into the programs, there, there needs to be a fundamental kind of shift in culture around keeping them there. Yes. So in yes, in those STEM programs. Right. So again, we're not looking at are you retaining them in the school? Are you retaining them in those STEM programs as well? Right. Uh, we also then asked, okay, you did that at the first year. So what does that cohort look like after two years with your institution? Uh, and so you see the numbers kind of dropping from there, 65 percent, and uh, well, 65 percent overall. So 80 percent down to 65 percent, and then 60 percent and 51 percent respectively. Um, the other, the other stat that we threw kind of at the bottom here are the number of institutions that have curriculum uh, program partnerships with high schools. So they've already established the bridge, and that might be supporting an AP program, a college and high school program, et cetera. So 40% of these institutions have already built uh, sustained programs with high schools. Yeah, and that's something high schools are looking for in terms of resources. absolutely, absolutely. So. Uh, before we go on to the next slide, just real quick, if you do have any questions, please feel free to uh, use the chat feature to ask those. Uh, if you haven't taken our poll yet, or if you haven't uh, kind of gone in there and let us know who you are, uh, please do that. We have uh, quite a few people that, that we haven't heard from yet, so uh, please take a chance to do that. And I would love to know where you are. And again, if you have any questions at all or things that you want us to address, please feel free to chat those up. I think there is some lag between the video portion and our answers. So if you ask a question, give us a few moments, we'll catch up to it, or you'll catch up to us. I'm just slow answering it too. Is it like a brontosaurus? Yes. Like you playing? Like you know, playing? Like how, how I tell I answer chat. Make fun of me. I was told I was <laughs> like a brontosaurus playing soccer. You know, <laughs> hard to get around because I don't react real well, right. real fast. So yeah. have a lot of space though, hard to get around. <laughs> That's excellent. So the next piece, <laughs> moving on from soccer here, the next piece of this is uh, we're looking at outreach programs. So these are STEM focused. Uh, what are they doing in terms of um, resources on campus? Right. Focused on science, technology, engineering, and math programs with recruiting, outreach, et cetera. So, um, so the first is they have a specific outreach program around their STEM program, 60%. Of the organization have a specific STEM outreach program. It actually seems like kind of a low number. I mean, it really does. Yeah. You, you, you think that that's an important piece that they need to have some kind of outreach program going. So only 60% of those schools really have yeah. any kind of an outreach at all going on. Well, and, and the way that we actually ask the question is interesting because what we want to look at is uh, at a comprehensive program across departments. So what you typically find at most uh, universities is they have an engineering program, outreach 
they're, they're doing marketing around or outreach around the, the biology program, right. the fitness program, whatever it happens to be, uh, which is frankly not efficient and it's not great experience for the students. So these organizations have actually have joint outreach where they, they under the umbrella of STEM, they're showing all the opportunities uh, around, we've got engineering, we've got this, we've got that, we've got aerospace science, we've got, you know, marine um, science and technology, those kinds of programs around there. So it gives students a diversity of opportunity. You may, you know, your reach and touch point with students may be very, very limited um, yeah. right now. And, and so that one thing, they may see that one class, that one visit to your school, um, or to your campus, that one, you know, website or web page you put on and all they see is engineering and that's not them. Yeah. And then yeah. They, they don't understand that there's so much more that they could right. be. So. And you know, to, to make an analogy to to being a chef, nice. if you go and try. Yeah. So if you go to a, you know a restaurant and all they all they serve are you know, grapes, you know, grapes. That's going to appeal to to some people in a small amount, but you're probably not going to really want to go back to that restaurant or really do much because all they have is grapes. <laughs> grapes. <laughs> you know, but but yeah, a diverse right. a diverse menu. Would is, you call a restaurant that only serves grapes? I don't even know. Grapes of wrath. <laughs> you have a something for us. Yeah. Uh, go, let me know. Yeah. yeah. So, but but Grapes the idea of being <laughs> the idea of being that you know you yeah. when you go to a restaurant you want to have some you want to see a, a broad diverse many individual item you know has some some depth to it yeah. uh, and, and showing programs in isolation like that and and, and frankly that's how education's been for a long time where everything's in isolation yeah. high schools. Math for years has been taught as math, and it's you know never shall <laughs> cross right. over the hallway to the science classes and those things, which is doesn't make any sense because yep. you know anybody out there that that's part of the you know workforce development or that's that's uh, an employer of any kind, you know that that subjects are are integrated throughout the workforce, not isolated. Yeah, for sure, not isolated at all. So some of the other things that they have um, specific STEM admission counselor. Uh, so 41% have that uh, staff training to support around STEM students and STEM programs, 50%. So half of them have an actual training program for staff and faculty on how to support uh, STEM students throughout their, their trajectory, which is, um, you know, looking forward to kind of sharing with us what that actually means. Uh, STEM specific web page, 44%. So you're seeing some of that come again. It's this interesting piece of what it's just more expensive to go and have all these outreach and marketing for it. It's so separating. Right. Makes no sense. Um, combine them under that, you end up saving uh, resource and also connecting better with, with students uh, that are looking at kind of your organization. Um, STEM specific orientation program. So once you get on campus orientation program just for those students. A key piece that was interesting, we had uh, free tutoring on STEM subjects. Because uh, we're looking at STEM literacy, and so that's one of the pieces that we look So that those uh, organizations, 69% of those organizations that are getting the best outcomes are doing that and have free tutoring on It's actually really impressive that yeah. there's that 70% are offering up that, that, that element. That's, yeah. uh, that's awesome. That's fantastic. And it's a change, right? This is a yeah. beginning of a sea change in these programs because the traditional approach has been you come into the engineering program, uh, in the you know, calculus based science program that you're going to be taking here. Our whole goal is to fail as many of you as we can. Yeah, I mean, that's, they, they, they definitely try, they definitely push the attrition idea. Yes. They, want to, they want to wipe out all the ones that aren't qualified and only have the cream rise right to the top, and that's not really good business. Yeah, I don't know if you were able to see the interview we did with um, Land Grant uh, Universities, but uh, tremendous discussions with a number of, of those organizations around what, why they were formed, right, to create opportunity. Uh, for all students, and and typically tend to have more programs well developed around supporting students in these STEM programs, as opposed to like uh, kind of the, the chopping them out of the Right, right. Um, so then STEM themed clubs. So lots of clubs certainly on campus there, but that's a part of it. Like you do what you love. Do you have opportunities, activities around students so they can begin to see themselves in real world situations and enjoying these kinds of careers. First thing is a recognition that just the, the combination of these things under that one umbrella is starting to take hold slowly yes. but surely. For sure. Making some progress. All right. So another piece that we've got, uh, we're going to move on to employers. So any questions that you all may have around that or thoughts, um, you, you can gauge around on the, uh, as colleges. Uh, let us know. Uh, and then we're going to 
zip through here because I know we're moving into QA. Yeah, I said. Um, so employers. Now employer numbers not so great. What I did here was not looking at uh, necessarily the best. I wanted to look at all the employers that we kind of surveyed and get kind of the average uh, for those. So um, tracking STEM job openings, only 41 percent. Now part of that is they have no idea what a STEM job right. is. They're not, they're, not, they're not thinking of those ways. Yeah. So let's, yeah, which is interesting, right? So these are employers we're talking to. We surveyed um, several hundred employers, and uh, frankly, they didn't. Uh, there's so much disagree disagreement or misunderstanding about what a STEM job is that only 41 percent are even tracking it. Uh, interesting. Well, it'd be interesting to talk to the same employers and say, okay, so you're saying it's not a STEM job? Do they use critical thinking? Do they use data analysis? Do they use technology to enhance what they're doing? Yes. Are they are they engineering solutions to things? You know, getting them really to think about what the actual activities are, which is really what what we've done in terms of taking the the competencies that go into each job mm -hmm. and and tracking those to to student interests and those kind of things around our STEM type. Yes. Um, you know, and that's they, once you talk them through that, mm -hmm. they start to recognize that oh well those well yeah those are actually things that I have my employees do. Wow, I didn't think about that. Yeah, and so the the ones so of the forty one, this next number is of the forty one percent. That are tracking their STEM job openings. 65% of those openings happen to be STEM jobs. Um, so, one you can't you, you know you can't get better at or, or have even any insight into uh, what you're doing if you aren't tracking it. So, should that, those organizations have a program working with colleges and with high schools in the pipeline workforce development around STEM? They should because best for their workforce is there. Uh, some of the other things we asked: so tracking employees with STEM degrees. And so what we're really trying to get at here is the sense that a, a bachelor's is not a bachelor's, it's not a bachelor's, a high school diploma is not a high school diploma. Right? It, it, what you take has meaning right? and helps to differentiate you. But unfortunately, uh, those in the workforce development world understand this, right? Typically the requirement will be for a bachelor's degree. And it could be anything, and then you can kind of meet that requirement. That makes no sense. So only 23% of these employers that we surveyed actually track employees who have STEM degrees. It's kind of amazing 23% do that, but so few track that, and that's uh, that's a, a cultural change that we need to change. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, we've had a discussion many times about the idea that a high school diploma has been completely devalued, uh, you know, that uh, employers are looking for, not for associate's degree and those kind of things, and it's, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it really is, what did you take? What skills do you have? How does that track to what I need you as an employer to be able to do? Uh, the degree means means you know so so. Well. I have a funny degree story that I'll share at a future time. Okay. About uh, when I when I transitioned from one state to another and had to get recertified for mathematics. Yes, yeah. reciprocity is always a great. Yeah, it's a it's a funny story about uh, about yeah. Now you kind of let on and are going to tell the story. I can tell it real quick. Tell real quick. Well, so I had it was, it's pretty fast. So okay. EP is going to be dirty look, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. So I was transferring from one state to another. I won't tell which ones. Uh, but when I when I <laughs> called about getting my my certification uh, for this state that I was going into, I was told, well, we have we have higher standards in the states. So you have to take some additional classes uh, around mathematics. And so I asked which classes, and they said, any doesn't matter. <laughs> so that was the, you know, it literally was just a requirement that needed so many credits. It didn't matter what it was, it didn't have yeah. to. They had to be math classes, but it didn't matter what math classes. And so, yeah. you know, it really was, uh, speaks this idea that we have these kind of rules and guides in place that don't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're not really tracking what matters. So, yeah. basic piece there. Uh, so let's, we're going to move into here. I know we're getting to the end of our time frame here. Um, we have a few more minutes, so we'll keep you on here. Thank you for staying late with us. Because EP we're, says we're good. So. Yeah, OK, says we're good. Um, so let's look at uh, the average of those 23% that actually track with a STEM degree. 57% of their employees actually have STEM degree on average, degrees on average, which is uh, interesting. So what are you tracking out there? Um, average percent of STEM degrees uh, of that group, so only 29%. Wow. So obviously, you know, a challenge there. Um, average STEM degrees of, of among the minority employees in the positions only only 14 percent of their employees have STEM degrees. Um, the challenge again. The next piece we've got is recruiting for STEM capable candidates. How many of you actually recruit around students who are STEM capable, which means that you have finished a certificate, um, licensure, whatever, around a degree program around uh, STEM? 44 percent actually have recruiting for that. You would think more would be recruiting around that. Only 44 percent. 
Uh, of those that use social networking for recruiting, only 39%. That seems exceptionally low. Yeah. Uh, what they the use times. is LinkedIn. Right. LinkedIn. Um, that which is, you know, but the colleges are getting it. Like we're students in different ways. Employers are using the LinkedIn piece. How do you transition your students into that? So they can actually get access to these programs. Well, maybe there's not a lot of uh, great tools that are out there for for, for doing that. Or they don't like to get return on it, so they if they, if they need some way to, to make those connections, some way to bridge that gap. Yeah. So yeah. So how are they doing that? Other ways that they're doing, they're reaching out, uh, involved in recruitment, involved in this. So this is STEM specific, right? Not just general recruitment fairs. STEM specific recruitment fairs. Uh, campus visits to colleges based on a STEM. You know, base recruiting model, 26%, uh, so pretty low there. Community-based STEM advance, which is interesting, so 42% engaged in that. So that's the first robotics types of activities. Um, I keep mentioning that. We've got other partners out there. 4-H would be another uh, great partner around these STEM activities. So, so that could be an area, right, uh, where everyone comes around these particular events. The challenge with that is then, so our partners tell us this, right, yeah. why we're partners with them. Uh, what do I do next? So we've had this great event. It's you know, consumed maybe a total of uh, you know 200 hours, 100 hours at the time. You have the student, etc. What's next? How does that connect to a right. career? How does that connect to a degree program? That's the connection piece that we really work on. Here. Yeah, we met that young man down in uh, Atlanta, uh, probably about what maybe 10 or 12 years old, wearing a USA soccer shirt on. He was talking about how he did a robotics program, loved robotics, and we asked him, what did you want to do with that? And he was like, I don't know. You know and yeah. the, just, just the connection there of sports and robotics and things with prostheses and, and all the different uh, sports sciences that go on. You think about golf and those swing machines that they use to test out golf. I mean, so much of the robotics and sports, uh, but that connection just isn't made. And it's, and it's, it's just tough to do. Yeah, it's tough to do, and it's... Um the shame that it doesn't happen. So, yeah. uh, these numbers are, are probably the most shocking because this is last year's data, right? Um, several hundred employers we talked to have, so do you have a female specific STEM recruiting program and a specific uh, STEM recruiting program around minorities? Only 16% and 18%. Yeah, really, really sad. So you're not going to build the pipeline with that kind of a... Well, that's why those other numbers we showed earlier are, are what they are. Yes. You know, you're not going to have minorities and females in those positions if you're not actively recruiting for them. Yes. So that what that means is then for our high schools and for colleges that are with us, you you know, hopefully you're you're engaging with employers in these recruiting programs. It may be on you and on us uh, to fill out these kinds of opportunities. Right. Uh, so the last kind of numbers, I've got a few more that we'll zip through here. Uh, percentage involved in workforce development programs. So I know uh, one of our Terry was uh, involved in that. Yeah. So seventy two percent of those that took our survey said that they are involved in the workforce development in the local area, 66% in community partnerships, 61% uh, focused in local area recruitment uh, and, and workforce development at events, 48% in regional, 30% national, only 7% uh, in international um, programs that are out there. So that's interesting. And, and ultimately, when I was at the Department of Labor, what you find is that hiring is local, right? I mean, you certainly have virtual positions, et cetera. You may move candidates around, but fundamentally, it comes down to the local area. And they want to be able to recruit out of local area and not bring them in. Uh, we work pretty closely in the, the Pittsburgh area here. You get the Marcella Shale industry. And up to uh, about a year ago or so, there were 80% uh, of the employees were coming from out of state into those areas. A significant challenge. You know, and then you're looking at other states where they're kind of pulling um, your local talent away because right. the opportunities may not be in that local area. You look a lot at the, uh, lot of the big industries where they relocate, where they build factories or plants or where they build offices. <clears throat> it's where the talent is. They want, they want to build those places where they can hire locally, where they can draw from that, that community. So they're often looking for what are the communities that have these outreach programs going on that really are fostering great STEM partnerships and, and STEM programs. You know, so as communities begin doing that more and more and more, companies are looking to come in there to do more work. That happened in you know, our friend in Charleston and Boeing, actually. Uh, you know, huge, huge investment in, in that area, uh, largely because of all the great things that are going on around STEM and, and those programs uh, down there in Charleston. Yeah, for sure. The, the last piece we're looking at here is Academic institution partnerships are asking employers, how are you partnering with academic institutions? Um, but we went all the way down. So you know, are you working with elementary schools, 13%? Uh, 
Uh, so there are some that have programs all the way down elementary school, middle school, 18%. You see the jump at high schools, 38%. Um, high school partnerships exceed that of career and technical, uh, the 34. Vocational schools at 30%, community colleges 39%, college and university at 56%. You would think that those would be much higher yeah. because like you're hiring new people every year for a new jobs. Where are you getting places. them from? Yeah. And even even the high school, you know, the K-12 sector, I think you're seeing more and more of the corporate entities really start to realize that hey, we have to we have to get these kids interested in in these careers early on. I know again as a high school teacher, by the time I, I got students in my class, they had largely made their choices uh, around how they felt about STEM, and it was really you know, a big part of my job to try to switch them. Uh, around in that in that sense, so um, yeah, it's it's critical that they start really making that investment um, all the way down the line. Yeah, a big mismatch that we find with that. Uh, so if we went back and looked at your community partnerships. So it's sixty six percent right with these community partnerships and the after um, community based events forty two percent right. So then we asked you from a recruiting standpoint, your partnerships with after school programs five percent. So they're engaged in these robotics programs and events and activities and not looking at them at all from a recruitment standpoint. Yeah, no, after, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's... It's, it's doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so anyway, I, and part of this is, right, is that we're connecting with these employers. The employers that we are connecting with are interested in, in having meaningful partnerships and relationships. Um, part of the, the plan of the program that we have, and you're kind of holding a symbol of what that is, the sponsorship side, is matching you as an organization, whether you're high school, a college, or an employer, uh, together and coming around that and giving you effectively a turnkey solution um, for establishing and building partnerships. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really focuses in on, uh, you know, understanding student interests. Like I said, when I was teaching, that was always the biggest thing. I didn't know where my students were coming from. So how can I connect them to those those careers? Uh, I don't know what careers are out there, so how can I do that? And you know, this this program that we have, starting with our STEM type quiz, really focuses in on, on giving students and educators that that sense of direction in terms of okay, for for Johnny over here or for Susan over here or whoever. Uh, what about Kim or Sarah. Kim or Sarah or even EP maybe if he was in my class. Yeah. I probably would have kicked EP out of my class, frankly, based on what I know. By the way, he's shaking his head over there. Yeah. Our time uh, but right. giving me a sense of direction as an educator about how do I connect what I'm teaching to what they're interested in. Um, and again, teachers don't have training right now. So this gives them a great, tremendous amount of resources for doing that. But it also gives those students that, that real sense of vision about where is this going and, and what's really out there for me and how can I do what I love. Yeah, uh, we at SimJoff have spent a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of time, research, and development. About four years have gone into this um, PhD level analysis. What we did was actually take uh, you know, the way that you report to so the CIP codes uh, that colleges report to uh, the Department of Education, the ONET index, which is uh, how employers um, identify the occupations that they're hiring for. The standards is a new piece that we're actually bringing into this whole puzzle around that. Um, did a lot of analysis, regression analysis, et cetera, uh, testing around the questions and the way that we're wording that to get the ideal uh, suite of very simple questions to ask for students. And then correlated around competencies. So what do you need to know and do well in order to function in this type of occupation? Now when you, we gather the competencies uh, set to the eight different categories is how it wound up uh, uh, falling out. And, and then associated the occupations there. And so the interesting thing is, is a student can uh, very easily work through the, you know, the content that we've got, which goes into lesson plans, which goes into you know, posters, et cetera. Our, our, all of our media kind of centers around these. They find out that they're an explorer, an advisor. It's sort of their first type, their major type. Uh, we just, they discover the occupations. And so those organizations that uh, participate in the survey with us we, we bring your content and your model into, into all of this uh, programming and then distribute that uh, nationally. And it gives a simple way for students to figure out first, what do you love? And then answers all these questions, right? right. Is there a place for me? Uh, how do I, how can I get there if, if I can get there? And when will I ever use this? this yeah. uh, I, having seen students do this, it's amazing. The first thing that they comes out of their mouth once they, they get this and they start looking at jobs is, oh, wow. That's almost always the first thing you kind of hear is something along those lines. Like, oh, I didn't know I could 
Like that's a job, you know. And and they start to see it, and you see them really get uh, excited about this. Another funny story, real quick. I know EP is going to kill me here, but uh, my my wife teaches very very uh, difficult students, yeah. special ed students. We talked about this before, and um, she will kill me probably for having shared this story. But uh, <laughs> one, of, one, yeah. one of her students got really really upset and, and started to sort of rip some things off of the walls at, at her classroom. Mm. Uh, when it came to our poster, uh, our, our, our STEM type job poster, the student carefully unhinged it from the wall and set it aside <laughs> and then went off carrying everything off the wall. But it just shows you, yeah. like, this is the impactful stuff. This really engages students uh, in this in a way that, that they haven't had before. Yeah. So. so that is powerful. And that's, you know, we're building on engaging more of you to that. If you'd like to learn uh, more about this, you know, give us your, your information name and we'll be pushing that out. How can you be engaged in this? Uh, the opportunity that we, effectively that we have is for uh, for high schools. Now, high schools can certainly pick up the, the resources. We send a lot of resources out for free. Your students can all take this STEM type uh, quiz for free and get access to um, the surveys are all free and participating in all of this. To get it into a turnkey type of model, uh, there is a cost to high schools. But it, colleges and employers can pick up that cost for those high schools. Yeah, the opportunity for colleges and employers to, to sponsor high schools uh, is, is just the best way to uh, help support the STEM programs that are going on in those high schools uh, and start to build those connections, build those bridges to really get these three entities working together closely um, and, and allowing students to really see uh, see themselves in those STEM careers to help support teachers in facilitating that. Um, and, and to make the connections from that, that high school uh, or K-12, middle school, elementary school level uh, to those training institutions, colleges, universities, uh, technical schools, whatever it may be, um, into, into careers in, in a real and meaningful and impactful way. Absolutely. Are we allowed to EP ask any questions or is our time done here? Got a quick question. Time was, we can sneak it in here. <laughs> We've been getting the end this uh, signal for a long yeah, time. So. If he's like, whatever. So yeah. if you guys have any questions, please do uh, ask those. Um, yeah. We've got a, a schedule that we're putting together for uh, for the next uh, series of events that we're coming up here, and uh, we'll be opening up um, you know, curriculum programs. We'll be highlighting uh, different STEM activities that are out there, ideally getting onto some campuses and looking at uh, best practices in there, um, unveiling some of, the, uh, some of the industry awards that we'll be handing out here, the, the next edition also covering uh, content that's in the next edition. So lots of uh, interesting stuff coming out uh, from STEM Jobs Labs. You joining us here, we certainly appreciate uh, you being part of this, and you'll get the first um, first look into some of these programs and activities, like our STEM Jobs uh, approved surveys, but also the quiz uh, that we have on hand that will highlight your organizations and help make those connections um, for you or for your students. Right. Yeah. yeah so you know. Like Daniel said, we'll be doing more of these Hangouts. Um, if you have anything that you want us to explore or, or uncover or dive into, let us know. Um, and uh, please reach out to us if you're interested in more information on uh, sponsoring a, a school or if you're a high school, uh, picking up some materials, resources. Like Daniel said, a lot of it's free, uh, but there's some great things that, that you can pick up that are really, really inexpensive, turnkey solutions to get your STEM program really supercharged uh, very quickly, very easily. Yes, and let us help find some matches for you. So. Yeah, absolutely. So until next time, we appreciate your time. Uh, and as always, do what you love. love.